I, I saw that you talked about some of the more, most interesting supplements that came out of the ITP. And I just wanted to touch on a couple of those. Uh, so one of them was um, 17 alpha estradiol. So that, which did seem to have like a positive effect on mice. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? And where is the data on that? Because at, at the moment I, I only saw kind of mice data. Yeah, that's right. So we've gone through why the interventions testing program or the ITP is such a good program. Um, so when they tested 17 alpha estradiol, it extended male mice lifespan. It was close to 20%, which is massive, um, but it didn't affect female lifespan. So it, it sounds a bit baffling that you would give a type of estrogen to males and that extends lifespan. Um, but the, the crucial thing about 17 alpha is that it's what we call a, a non-feminizing estrogen. So it, it seems that by using this, this type of estrogen, um, it's binding to certain receptors that for whatever reason seem to be extending lifespan. So in humans, it, it's, it, it's very, very common. I think it's in, across all countries in the world. Women live longer than men by around, I think it's three to five years. So it, it's possible that by using 17 alpha estradiol in, in males, um, that we might see a lifespan extension benefit. So, you, but you're absolutely correct that at the moment it's my starter. It's interesting. And I would definitely not recommend that anyone take 17 alpha at this stage. It, it needs to go through the, the safety trials. And it's the same thing with rapamycin uh, um, that there's, you know, some, some people who mentioned in the, in my YouTube comments that they're taking rapamycin the, the human data is not there yet. It's exciting preclinical work, but the human data is not there yet. Um, so with 17 alpha, if I had to choose another molecule to study aside from rapamycin, I think it would be 17 alpha. Interesting, but we, we don't really understand the mechanism. Do you know, are there, are there human trials with 17 alpha currently ongoing? I think there was a phase one trial that was done a fair few years ago. Um, just to see if, you know, if humans take it, will there be any massive downsides? So, um, and there didn't seem to be any, but that, that was a phase one trial. And it's, yeah, so it, it's at its infancy, essentially. So if, if, if I had all the money in the world, I would want to do a very similar trial to rapamycin, but in, in males for 17 alpha, because it looks like by giving, giving 17 alpha to males, there was some mice data suggesting an improvement in muscle performance. So I would want to do essentially this, the same trial that I'm doing for rapamycin, but only in males and using 17 alpha again to see if there was a muscle performance benefit. So, and so the other one or another one that you talked about was SGL2 inhibitors, right? So yeah, could you just briefly introduce what, what they're doing? Um, SGLT2 inhibitors are medications prescribed for diabetics. So every day I'm invariably prescribing uh, SGLT2 inhibitors to my diabetic patients. How it works is that it encourages the kidneys to pee out sugar. Um, and that gives good uh, blood sugar control, but it also seems to protect the kidneys really well and protect the heart really well. So that's one of the big reasons for prescribing it in clinical practice. And when the interventions testing program trialed it, there was a lifespan extension benefit seen as well. And why I'm particularly excited around this about this medication is that there's human data showing that in non-diabetic people who have got chronic kidney disease, by taking um, SGLT2 inhibitors, we do seem to slow the progression of, ki of kidney uh, dysfunction. So I think the data will start to come through showing that even milder versions of chronic kidney disease, if you use um, SGLT2 inhibitors, I think, well, I'm hopeful that we'll see um, a slowdown in the progression of kidney disease there, because that gives even more reason for people to, to be using it who don't have chronic kidney disease yet. So the, the kidney function, again, it starts to decline around, I think it's 25 years old. So if we can use SGLT2 inhibitors to hold on to the kidney function that we've got, that's pretty powerful. So the, the human data is starting to come through for that. Again, I wouldn't suggest that, um, that people start using these medications just yet unless they're a diabetic patient, but the, the data is quite encouraging. And I think if, if out of all of the molecules that, that um, I'm excited about, I think 
SGLT2 inhibitors will be the first one to actually be used in, in the wider population um, for so-called health span benefits. When you, if you're using SGL2 inhibitors, which are lowering the blood glucose, I guess, uh, would you also, would you combine that with metformin or kind of it's one or the other? So in type two diabetic patients, yes, I do. But in for, for non-diabetic patients, no. no, no. Um, there, there was actually, I, I recently did a video about some data that came out about using metformin in non-diabetic patients. And essentially there was no benefit seen. So in pre-diabetic patients and in type two diabetes patients, metformin is the, the go-to medication alongside a great diet and regular exercise. Um, but for non-diabetic patients, um, the human data and the mice data at this stage doesn't support using metformin. The, the one thing I did see about the SGL2 uh, inhibitors is that they, they, they kind of lowered the glucose curve because, I mean, even if you're healthy, I mean, that is one of the things you want to try and avoid is, is like a big after dinner spike. Um, and it seemed to help with that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It seems to blunt the blood glucose spikes, which seems fantastic. Um, so, so, so that's a, that's a possible mechanism for why we're seeing lifespan extension benefits in mice. In humans, th there's a slightly different mechanism for how it protects the kidneys. Um, and it seems to actually lower the, the blood pressure um, in the filtration system of the kidneys. And, and it's that lower pressure that seems to reduce the damage, if you like. But we still don't 100% yet know why we get um, important benefits for the kidneys by using this class of medication. So, so there's still some work to be done there. But it, it seems apparent that for chronic kidney disease patients, SGLT2 inhibitors it's a pretty promising uh, medication. So glycine. So you talked about um, glycine and, and NAC, and you, you kind of combine them. And then they hopefully create glutathione. So A, can we talk about that? And, and why not just take glutathione? Can yeah. So with, again, coming back to the interventions testing program, when they supplemented glycine and the, the glycine that they were supplementing, it was like 8% of their diet. So it was huge. Um, you, you saw a lifespan extension benefit. Um, so it, it's, it's tricky to, to move that into humans because we're not about to take 8% of our calories via glycine. I've, I, that's not realistic. Um, so the human data still needs to come out. But one of, the, um, one of the important things that glycine does is that it's a building block for glutathione, which is a powerful antioxidant in the body. Um, and alongside NAC, um, or cysteine, which is another building block, it helps to rebuild glutathione. So the, the debate between oxidants and antioxidants is actually quite interesting. So back in the 90s, it was thought that, you know, oxidants, all oxidants are bad and that they damage the, the DNA, they damage the cells, and we want to get rid of them. We want to boost antioxidants as much as possible. And that doesn't actually seem to be the case. Using antioxidants um, doesn't really seem to give many benefits in humans. And actually, it does seem to get in the way of exercise uh, benefits um, in humans. So if you take antioxidants after you've exercised, you seem to get in the way of oxidants actually stimulating our mitochondria and our cells to become more efficient. So it looks like you want to balance between oxidants and antioxidants. But as we age, it seems that that balance gets out of kilter and that overall the oxidants start to take over. Um, and, and we can see that because in blood, the glutathione levels appear to go down after about the age of 45. So if we can rebuild our glutathione stores by using glycine and NAC, um, that, that's interesting. And there's some, da some human data coming out showing that if you, use, um, if you use these building blocks of glutathione as well as nicotinamide riboside, it actually seems that you can recover from COVID-19 three days faster. Um, so that was some human data that came out last year. So that, that's interesting. Um, but coming back to your question about why can't we just use, uh, why can't we just take glutathione if that's what we're trying to rebuild? The body struggles to absorb glutathione by itself. And there's now what we call liposomal versions of glutathione, which allow glutathione to be absorbed. The trouble is if, if, you, if you wrap things up in, in, a, in a liposomal form, that molecule can then directly get into the cell. There's no way for the cell to monitor or, or regulate its levels. So there's not enough, in my opinion, there's not enough safety data just to be taking liposomal glutathione. 
Um, because again, we, we want that balance between oxidants and antioxidants. There's the theoretical risk that by taking liposomal glutathione, that you're just flooding your cells with too much antioxidant. It's a theoretical risk that needs to be proven out in human clinical trials, which we, I, I've not, I'm not aware of any long-term trials of liposomal glutathione. So that's why I'd much rather take the building blocks of glutathione so that my cells have got the option of building as much or as little glutathione as they want so that they can actually regulate it. And I don't think that these molecules actually need to be taken until about 50 years old. Um, because like I said, our glutathione levels, they, they're pretty constant up until 45 or 50. So, so suppose we, we go down the glycine and NAC route. So how much do you need to take? Because like you said, the mouse, mice data, it was kind of a lot. It's true. It's difficult to answer this because right. we've got, we've only got trials looking at what's called the so-called combined metabolic activators, which is yeah the, the group of molecules that was tested for COVID-19 patients and also for fatty liver. And there's exciting data coming through around that. Essentially, all I can do is quote what dosages they were using in, in those trials. Um, so instead of glycine, they were actually using um, L-serine, uh, which is converted by the body into glycine. And I believe it was about 15 grams of L-serine twice a day. And then for NAC, it was something similar as well. So, so hefty dosages. Um, but but that's... <sighs> It's difficult because I, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable taking that. If I was 50 years old, I would not take those dosages because we don't have enough long-term human safety data on that. Um, and, and we don't for 100% certainty know that it's going to be effective for other diseases and, and for other you know chronic diseases of aging. So personally, and all I can say is what I would do, I would take around one and a half grams of each of those molecules twice a day. I wouldn't take more than that until we've got longer, uh, yeah, more safety data coming through.